bell curve. I mean, they're thought to be their families. The, develop the developers in New York are families, and often that's deemed a good thing because they have they think long term, and the newcomers are looking for the quick buck. And that always leads me to wonder about if there's a possibility of changing the um, the lifespan of buildings. I don't really fully understand what a developer thinks about buildings in terms of how long is he into it. You know, how long, what, I don't even understand it, but I'd like to see that change, or can that change in terms of uh, developers, does, does it have to be families because they'll invest in a building project with a 30 life you know, development plan, or is it always, is it just getting inevitably shorter and shorter? Um, so that kind of fascinates me about uh, you know, how that plays out, particularly in New York. I don't know if the family thing is. You know, I think that business model is really changing. If you look at the history of that business model, it's because, you know, very smart people started years and years ago, had kind of barriers to entry in terms of other professions. They couldn't quite get into white shoe investment banks and so forth, but they were smart and they knew how to do things, and so they bought a brownstone, and that turned into two, and that turned into four, and that turned into an empire. And then, you know, they gave it to their children, right? The, the, the thing about that model is, you know, in that model, you're absolutely right. You know, no sort of old, salty developer wants to build a condo, right? They want to build a rental, and they want to bump the rent every year, and they want to, you know, that's what they want year after year after year. This condo thing is new, and it's created a completely different breed of developer. And in some ways, it's very interesting. Like, if you look around the online, there are sites there that are done by smaller developers, sometimes like architects who turn developer, where, you know, a kind of off-the-shelf developer would look at some of these sites. You know, there's a site that's like an L-shaped site. It's got a gas station sitting in the middle of it. We were talking about it on a panel the other night. You know, no kind of off-the-shelf New York developer would have touched the damn thing, right? These two guys, they went in, they designed this condo thing, it's got some party poles where the gas station is, and there it is, and it's up and it's running, and it's, you know, it's quite successful. So, what gives me hope about that, and I think it's part of what the program's about, is that, you know, it actually means that if you actually put a more creative mindset to it, you can get outside of the box. I mean, Charlie's question about um, the large footprint office buildings and the World Trade Center site, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, the World Trade Center site is driven by a lease that says there needs to be 10 million square feet on the site. And so you have these mammoth buildings. And the, the, the problem is that mammoth buildings are driven, and people, I, I wouldn't even blame Larry and the development community, those 40,000 square foot footprints and those big trading floor footprints, they're absolutely driven by the brokerage community. The brokerage community, they come in and they look at a floor plate and they say, it's got to be 45 foot cord of glass and it's got to be X dimension and it's got to be a square. Oh, it's got a little angle in it that doesn't work at all, right? And it's this, you know, and the problem is that kind of formulate thought drives another formula, another formula, another formula. Is there part of that formula too that it has to pay back or you Sure, you know, sure, absolutely. And a lot of the green building conversations center on that. And the thing is, is that if you break that cycle, if you find a way to fundamentally break that cycle, and you bring in a different form of developer who can actually look at those rules and do something with them, I think then you have something different. Mm -hmm. so, any uh, guidelines to develop in the future? Yeah, and I guess this may be more of a structural issue, but with anything big in New York, there's this temptation of developers to overpromise and you know say we'll build a giant green roof and you know, an organic farm and 80 percent affordable housing and uh, you know free basketball for everyone. And um, it, you know not to name any specific projects, uh, and then just renegotiate as soon as. Uh, the deal is clenched, as you kind of said with the design, which wasn't that big an issue. Uh, so, I mean, it, it seems that's incredibly common. You, you don't really win if you don't do that, but uh, I guess impatience or realism to propose it. But it's also, it's also an, there's an ethical, you're also appealing to a certain kind of ethics, and I think it relates also to the point about time. I, mean, I think the, the uh, report point about the traditional real estate families of New York having a very, very special ability to see things in the long term, to be in a way caretakers of the city. I think this is um, the 
this is again we're going to speak about preservation of attitudes. So these are these are these are values I think that are fast to speed fast to speed development needs to somehow incorporate as an as an asset. I think the ethical issue is very, very important. Your your development in the future? Uh, 